If you are new to this story, um, if you are in the room and you don't believe in Jesus, if you have questions about faith and God, you come from a, another religious background, or if you've been following Jesus for some years, I think you picked a good day to be with us uh, this morning because we're going to get into some, uh, some challenging questions. We are in a series called The God Questions, and uh, just to frame that a little bit, we've asked you to send in your questions to us, some of the things that you wrestle with, uh, perhaps are looking for answers for, and uh, we've started to work through those. And today, I'm going to try and take a whole lot of the questions, put them together, I'll read some of them to you, and then through this message, try and address some of these different questions. This might be your question, it might trigger something in your mind that you have, um, it generates more questions, actually, that's the idea, is to get you asking more questions, and uh, here are some of them. What did Jesus do between when he died and rose on the third day? Like his body was in the tomb, but where did his spirit go? What happened? Did he go to hell to take the keys back and then come back to earth? Or did he go to heaven, like he said to the guy on the cross next to him and said, today I'll see you in paradise? Um, another one, are there angels among us today? And uh, husbands, this is, this is not your wife. This is not your angel. <laughs> just by the way, in, in the Bible, all the angels are male figures. Just, <laughs> just putting that out there. I don't know why I said that, but anyway, <laughs> particularly in, in relation to our loved ones who are now with the Lord. I think this question is, is leaning towards the fact, like, uh, can people who've, who've passed on, can they come back as angels and, and be in our lives today? Uh, another one, there's a big one. Maybe you've asked this question, can I lose my salvation? So I've, I've followed Jesus, so I feel like I'm committed, but at the moment, I feel like the busyness of this world has me distracted and I know for a fact I'm not as engaged as I should be, so can my current sin, the thing you did last night, or, or the fight you had on the way here this morning with your family, can that cause me not to go to heaven if I were to die right now? Another one, if heaven is, uh, is not a destination, so we've been speaking about that, but rather it's a kingdom, it's the presence of God that will be fulfilled as per the book of Re Revelation, the last book in the Bible. If heaven on earth is us reigning together with God, what happens to all the dead people? Where are they right now? Like we're waiting for Revelation to be fulfilled, so where is everybody that's no longer with us? Uh, another one, if Jesus is the only way, then what about all the other religions who never had a chance to hear about Jesus? Are they doomed for hell? Some easy questions today. Are you guys ready? Yes. I, I'm warning you up front. You may need to go back and, and, and re-watch this because this might be like just a lot of information and content coming your way this morning, uh, but you can go back and you can work through it. I do encourage you, don't just take my word for this, but please go and dig into it if this is something that uh, that sparks more questions than you, uh, let's talk. You can engage and, and we can send you uh, some notes or, or more details about this. But I thought it, an appropriate title for all these questions together would just be like, what happens next? What happens next? So heaven, hell, and, and all that stuff. What happens next? And the best place to begin, I think, is with a story. So some years ago, Amy and I were in the season of going to 21st birthdays. Like now we're in the season of going to 40th birthdays. But <laughs> some time ago we used to go to 21st birthdays. And when we, when we lived in Cape Town, we were invited to a 21st birthday of a friend of ours and it was in Camps Bay. And uh, we went to the birthday party and it was a sleepover birthday party, uh, which was wise at that time. I won't go into details about that. And uh, what had happened in the lead up to the 21st birthday is Amy's Diggs, the place where she stayed at university, had been broken into. And they'd taken literally everything out of the flat, and all her, her, a whole lot of her stuff was taken in clothes and all these kind of things. So through the insurance company, they paid out a lump sum to go and replace everything. So we went to this place in, in um, what, what was it called? Access Park, where, like the discount factory stores. And we spent the whole morning there and replaced all these things, like all kinds of new clothes for Amy and all this stuff, and we put it in the boot of my car. And it wasn't on the back seat, it was in the boot of the car, but it, had, it was a Jetta, CSX, my, my first car, this green Jetta, Jetta 3, and it, it had flip-down seats from the back. 
And, and we went to sleep that night probably, or that morning, I don't know, whenever it was. And then when I woke up, I could hear people whispering about me. You know when someone's talking about you, but you can't quite hear what they're saying, but you know they're talking about you. And, and I could hear my name being mentioned. I wondered, like, what is going on? Did I do something stupid last night? Probably. And anyway, I woke up and I went through and everything went quiet. And I was like, what's up? And they say, you should go and have a look at your car. And I walked out into the dri driveway, and some thieves had broken not one window, not two windows, not three windows, but four windows. I don't know why they did that. <laughs> and then flipped their seats down and stole all the stuff we had just bought. So in our naivety, we thought, well, we'll just claim from insurance again. So we tried, and the insurance company said, well, we'll pay for your car windows, but we're sure as heck not going to pay for the stuff that was in your boot because not insured. And we're like, but you're an insurance company. You're supposed to pay for stuff when, when stuff is stolen. And they're like, yeah, but that wasn't insured. And, and this was like a hard learning curve for us about the T's and C's of insurance companies. And I was thinking how many of us treat what happens next as kind of like an insurance policy. We have this kind of agreement with God, but we're not sure exactly what's in the T's and C's. And I know there's an underwriter in the house, so I'm just going to be careful with what I say here. And, and we have this attitude that we'll kind of just wait and see what happens. Like, I think I'm covered. And I'm not sure when my time is going to be up on this world, but, but I'm pretty sure, like, when that moment comes, I'm pretty sure in the T's and C's, like, I'll be covered. I think I'll be fine. Maybe you have that attitude. It's just like this vague idea of what happens next. Some of you are more assured of it, and, and, and some you have no idea, and you kind of, well, we'll just wait and see what happens. But I'm sure like God is nice, and, and he'll have mercy on me. And, and the thing is, like, none of us really know when our time is going to end, because we're all getting a little older. So this week I turned 40. I'm excited about that. I got so many messages, like, welcome to the, the club. I was like, whoa, there's a 40s club. I didn't know about this, but it's amazing. And, and what Amy did, is, is, together with the kids, is, is she'd been working behind the scenes in the lead up to the week because she turned, she turned 40 the week before. And I tried to do things like well for her, but she just completely outdid everything that I did. And, and she contacted friends from, from years gone by and some of you in the room and family and got everyone to write a, a message, a note, and there were gifts and things that came in, and, and the messages were like, what were some of the memories that they remember about me? And some of them were good, and some of them I won't share with you, and, and some of them gave me insight into things that I didn't know, but anyway, and then they put them on the wall in this, uh, I think it's there, yeah, in the 40s, and I got to read each one, and uh, there was a memory, and then there was also like a word of encouragement for the future, and honestly, I was so overwhelmed as I started to read through these messages, and I was like, what? This is what people see in me, and I battled to reconcile some of the words that were spoken to me and, and over me and the encouragement. I was like, really? Do, do people see that in me? And honestly, it was overwhelmed because I was confronted with my brokenness. And I felt deep inside of me like, I don't deserve these words and these encouragements. And the reason why I felt like that is because I know me, because I live with me. <laughs> and I know what goes on in my head and my heart and so, some of those dark thoughts and things that I'm embarrassed about and don't want to share with anyone. Like I know that stuff and I see a battle to reconcile these words of favor and, and grace and it just doesn't make sense to me to, like how to, how to receive that. And it gave me some insight into one of my struggles, which is I, I really battle a lot of the time to accept the grace of God because I know my brokenness. And I tell myself a story that goes something like this, like how can God give this to you because you don't deserve that? You see, the grace of God is something which is completely unmerited. It's undeserved favor. It's not something that you earn. It's just pure goodness. It's a gift to be received. And what I've realized is I really battle to receive because I feel like I don't deserve. And maybe you're in that same place. Maybe you battle to receive the grace of God because you see your sin and you see your brokenness and you know it and you acknowledge it and something in you goes like, I'm this bad because what you do is, is you judge your life on your worst days. And you look at all the worst days and the bad mistakes and the moments in your life and you, and you go, because of this, like how can God be nice to me? How can he give me grace because of this? This is the one hand, is you battle to receive grace because you see your sin. 
And that, that's like a constant battle for me is to be able to accept and receive the grace of God. On the other hand, in fact, this is probably not for you in this room, but you probably know some other Christian people, you can tell them about this one, is that you don't believe you need grace because you don't see your sin. Like I said, not for anyone in the room. But there are some people that you know that you would go, they should be here today to hear this, is they don't believe that they need grace because they don't see their sin. And the story that they tell themselves is something like this. Well, you know, I'm just a decent person. I try to be good. I try to have everything together. And I'm not a mass murderer, so I'm okay. And I kind of like God. So I don't really understand why I need grace because I'm not really a bad person. And people like this have lost sight of the holiness of God. And I think it has a lot to do with our culture and the self-esteem movement. Like everyone gets a trophy and everyone's just cool and everyone's good and, and you're not that bad. And we miss the holiness of God and, and miss that at our core, at our default, at the beginning, that our hearts are in rebellion to the God who spoke galaxies into existence and we don't see it as a problem. And, and both of these things of how we see grace and how we see sin, it, it, it affects our worldview of what we see as to what comes next. And, and to be able to set this up what, what I want to do is, is really like take a sprint, and this is the part where you might want to get your notebooks out, is we're going to sprint through some of the world religions and just take a, a quick look at, at what they're about it, in, in essence at the core and how they compare to true Christianity. And we'll begin with Buddhism. So Buddhism is primarily atheistic. In other words, there's no God. In fact, the core belief of Buddhism is that nothing exists. You don't have a soul. There's no sin. It's just a concept on a level which you will surpass one day. And the idea of Buddhism is that you will progress through your lifetimes towards a state of nirvana, which is moving into a state of nothingness. So it's just fading into nothingness. That, like, that's the goal. That's where you want to get to one day. And our idea sometimes about Buddhism is it's a lot about meditation, but it's actually a whole lot of hard work because Buddha set out the eight paths of Buddhism. And, and this is the, the, the paths of the right intention, right action, right concentration, right effort. Right speech, right livelihood, right understanding, and right mindfulness. And it's really hard work because through each lifetime, you've got to make sure that you're following these paths. And as you follow these paths, you will progress through the next life a little bit closer to nothingness. And then we have Hinduism. And Hinduism also teaches that, that you are trapped in this cycle of samsara or reincarnation of birth and rebirth. And the core idea of Hinduism is this idea of karma, and you've heard about that, what goes around comes around. And it has to do with this idea that the way you live this life is going to affect how you come into your next life. So if you're good here, your next life is going to be better, but if you're bad here, your next life is going to be worse. And the goal here one day, so Hinduism is monotheistic and henotheistic, it means that there is one God, Brahman, but this God can be represented in a multitude of different deities. And the idea is to be reunited with this God one day, but it's through your lifetimes as you progress and doing well, eventually you might get to a place where you are set free from the cycle of samsara, and that's a moment called moksha. And, and this is the moment where you're reunited with, with God, but you're never quite sure how much you have to do to be able to get there. And then, and then we have Islam. So Islam, it's a, the, the idea of Islam is, is that Muhammad, the prophet, he set out the, the five pillars of Islam. And the, the five pillars is that uh, you, you need to confess that Allah is the only God and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, You've got to give 2.5% of all your assets as alms. Uh, You've got to pray five times a day and follow a ritual according to that. You've got to fast every Ramadan for 30 days. And you, if you can afford it, you've got to go to Mecca, Muhammad's birthplace, uh, on a pilgrimage if you have the financial means. And if you do that, maybe you'll get to paradise, but not quite, because one of the beliefs of Islam is you have two angels. You've seen pictures like this, one on each shoulder. And the one on the right shoulder is counting your good works, and the one on the left shoulder is counting your bad works. And when you pass away from this life, there's gonna be this moment where there's a kind of balance the scales and see, did you do more good than bad? And then it's up to Allah 
in his mercy to decide, do you get to go to paradise or not? Because he can just override the angel's count. And the only, way, the only way to be guaranteed to enter into paradise is one of two things. You die at Mecca while you're on pilgrimage, or you die in holy jihad. So it's this idea of you've got to do a whole lot of things, but you're never quite sure if it's enough to make it into paradise. And there we have Jehovah's Witnesses. And we've seen... Uh, <laughs> around our neighborhoods. And on the surface, Jehovah's Witnesses, it looks a lot like Christianity. And, and there are some similarities, but they differ on some key doctrines. One of them being that Jesus is not part of the Trinity, that he's a, a deity, but not part of the Holy Trinity. And, and Jehovah's Witness, the message goes like this. Like salvation comes through faith and works. So you have to do a whole lot of work to be able to find salvation. Then we have Judaism. So Judaism is a, it stems from the Old Testament, but really from about 200 BC to 70 AD is when it was really formed. And, and Judaism, you can think of, a, of the Pharisees that Jesus engaged with during the scriptures. And Ju Judaism has, a, has a, a high emphasis on sin, but rejects the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. So you have to keep sacrificing and doing things to kind of pay for your sin. And then the last one for today is the Mormons or the Latter-day Saints. So, and there are more religions, but these are just some of the big ones and the, and the well-known ones, and some of you may have experience with this. The Mormons are really universalistic, which means that everyone will go to heaven, except a few people who are called the sons of perdition who will spend time in kind of quarantine hell area. But the rest of the people will get to go to one of three heavens, and the way that you get there depends on how many good works you do. So if you do a whole lot of good works, you'll make it to the highest heaven. Uh, if you don't do so much, you'll go to the second heaven. And if you just scrape it in, you'll go to the third heaven. And if you're a male in right standing with the Mormon church, you will become a god. In summary, if we look at, at, at these six major religions, which I have shared with you. Here's some of the things. They're all very much works-based with no guarantee of when you've actually made it enough. Like how good is good enough? There is no concept of grace, of undeserved favor, something that is a gift from God. There's no guarantee or assurance of salvation. You're waiting for this moment to see, if we get to them, then what happens? There's, there's nothing that guarantees anything beforehand, and there is no idea or concept of a loving and personal God. Everything that is done is in service to God and not in love or adoration of and let me say something else. Is when we step, as Christians, if you step into legalism, Christianity begins to look a whole lot like this. And this leads to this, this what we we'll call the traditional view. And this is the idea that many people have about what happens next. It's this kind of, you, you live your life here, you pass away, and then there's going to be this decision moment based on how you've lived your life. And that decision moment is going to determine, do you go to paradise or do you go to somewhere else? And, and all of the religions, except for, okay, the Hinduism, Buddhism, is, is you may go back to your earthly life and back to your earthly life and back to your earthly life. But everything else kind of builds into this mindset, as well as legalism. When, when Christianity becomes about all the things that you have to do, you have to do this to earn God's favor. This is the picture that we have. And some of you, you love Jesus and you follow Jesus. And in your minds, this is, subconsciously, this is the idea you have. Like, you're not sure, but one day you're going to die. And then there's going to be this moment where you decide, do you go here or did you make it into heaven? Not sure what's in your insurance policy in the T's and C's. And even if you don't believe this, people who you know who don't follow Jesus think you believe this. And this is the idea of, of what Christianity is like. Now, let me show you what, what the biblical view is. And we, to do that, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2 and start. I'll read you a few verses from uh, verse 1 in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit, now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath as others were also. And then it changes in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, he made us alive with Christ. 
even though we were dead in our trespasses. You, you're saved by grace. He also raised us up and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. It's not from works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So I, I want to show you, based on those verses, this, this biblical view. So let's take that earlier graphic that we had and redraw it. And, and this is not something that's original to me. We're leaning on some, some work done by our friends at the Bible Project, and we've spoken about this and, and all the details of what I'm going to speak about in the next few minutes. We actually did two messages last year, and you can have a look on the website. You can find them, Race to Life Part 1 and 2. It was the end of May, beginning of June last year, where we go into depth in these things. So I'm going to kind of move through this pretty quickly today, but just to show you a contrast between between some of the religions, some of the major religions and Christianity, true Christianity, and how this answers some of the questions that we had right up front. So if we begin on this side with creation, and this is what Chantel was talking about today, the spirit hovering over the waters. Here we have creation, and this is captured in the first book of the Bible, first few chapters, where God creates man in his image. And the idea of being created in the image of God is not to look like God, but it's this idea of ruling and reigning alongside God. And God creates this perfect design, co-ruling with humanity. Authority is given to humans, and everything is perfect. But there's an element of free choice given to humans, and humans in this moment, and this is in Genesis chapter 3, choose to say to God, well, we don't want your will to come. We want my will to come. And what happens is, is this moment of the fall and sin enters the world. And this, this sin, its consequence is that humans forfeit immortal life, which was given by God to humans right in the beginning of time. It's sin and death. It's not a physical death. That's a consequence, but it's really a spiritual death. It's a relational death. It's a separation from God. It's a move from how things should be to how God intended things to be to how things are now. There's this kind of division between God's created idea, design, to how things are that we live in the fallout of this now. And this problem of sin that we have, this rebellion in our hearts, this is, the, this is the concept, the idea where we go, well, I'm just a good person, but we miss the rebellion in our hearts that constantly chooses God, I want my will to be done, not your will to be done, this attitude of rebellion towards God, and Elise Strobel, he talks about it like this, it's as if you're standing on a, on a pier, let's say you're standing on a pier in Durban Harbor, and your goal is to long jump to Madagascar, So you take a run up, and you say, well, let's see how far I get, and you sprint down the pier, 100 meters, and you leap off the end, and, and the trajectory takes you because the pier is quite high, and you make it about five meters, and you swim back, and you think, well, I've got to do better. So what do you do over the next years? You get yourself long jump coaches, best in the world. You start taking supplements and all these things, and you put in that time and the effort, and one year later, you come back, and you sprint down the pier a little bit faster this time, and you jump, guess what, seven meters. And you're like, i got to try harder. This is what Genesis 3 did to us. If God was in Madagascar and we were on Durban Pier and all our efforts, our best effort, just take us perhaps a little closer and we've got absolutely no chance of getting there. And what Jesus does on the cross is he comes as an atoning sacrifice and he bridges the gap between the pier and Madagascar. And says, the way that you are restored to me is through me, not by your own efforts. And this is the idea of grace. And what happens is our, our work, we get so focused on trying to leap a little bit further by our efforts. I'm going to try a little bit better. I'm going to try a little bit harder. And we just get a little increment further. And we get so, so discouraged by our failures. And, and the message of the cross is actually that Jesus has, has, has opened the way, the invitation for us. So if we come back to this, this picture, there's creation and this moment of rebellion, and we all live in the consequence of this. And, and this, this is the, 
This is the life that we have in the, in the now and the not yet. This is where we hear the story of the gospel, that Jesus has come. He's finished work on the cross. And really, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, what it does is it restores us to the trajectory towards eternal life. So if you have a look, we created in the image of God. We fall. We're in the state of living death. You, you and I, before we come to Jesus, you are in a state of, of living death. Your trajectory is death, spiritual death, relational death, physical death, eternal death. And Jesus comes and he kind of bridges the gap between the pier and the island. He says, this is the way to eternal life, is to put your faith and trust in me. This is the gift of grace, unmerited, undeserved favor, driven by his love for you. And when you respond to that, what happens is you are seated, raised up. As Paul wrote in Ephesians, you once were dead in your trespasses, living death. But now, but now you are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. You are raised up through the finished work of Jesus on the cross to be restored to eternal life. And this is why we say that heaven is not something to wait for one day. Eternal life is not something that begins when your physical life here ends. It's something that begins the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Your eternal life begins now. And yes, there's still physical death coming, but it doesn't change the fact that eternal life has already begun for you. And this is life in the now and not yet. Now, there was a question about, well, what, what did Jesus do, you know, between the... Uh, but in, in those days where he died on the cross and then he was raised to life again. And, and honestly, there's a whole lot of controversy about that because there's different scriptures that say different things. So I'm, I'm not even going to attempt to try and answer that question. What, what I will say is the most important thing that matters is that he came back to life because the resurrection, everything hinges on the resurrection. And you can do that question as a homework project. Like where did Jesus' spirit go between? It's really interesting, but we haven't got time to get into all of that today. So we are in this place, life in, the now, life in the now and not yet. And then there was a question, well, what happens next? What happens between? Because we have this, this creation in the beginning where everything is, is perfect. And then in the end of Revelation, we've spoken about this before, is Revelation, everything comes back together and is God reigning with his people. So what happens in between? Because we know from the scriptures, Jesus is coming back at some point. So what happens from the moment when someone passes away now until Jesus comes back? And honestly, the Bible doesn't say too much about this. But theologians talk about this as the intermediate state. In other words, there's a state of between when someone dies now and Jesus comes back, which is not the permanent state. It's not the forever state. It's like a holding pattern. And there's a few verses. Uh, one of them is where Jesus on the cross says, today you'll be in paradise with me. There's another one, too, where Paul speaks about, he says, I long to be with Christ. It's better for me to depart and to be with Christ. And this leads us to believe that those who belong to Jesus, who put their faith in Jesus, if they pass away now, they are in some kind of intermediate state with Christ. Probably a conscious state. But it's not a permanent state. And there's no evidence that anyone who's in that state returns to earth as an angel. But it's kind of waiting for the resurrection to happen. And then the question is, well, what about those who don't believe in Jesus and have passed away? And all the Bible says about this is that they are in a place called the grave or Hades or Sheol, which is not hell, but it's also a holding place. And everything is waiting for this moment for where Jesus returns. And as Jesus returns in his second coming, we have the, the beginning of the new creation. Before that is judgment day. And this is where we get this idea of this, this is the moment where you decide, like, am I going to heaven or am I going to hell? But the biblical view of that is this, this is already decided by the choices that we make in life that we have now, because those choices set us on a trajectory. So when judgment day comes, it's really the beginning of new creation. What's going to happen is those who belong to Jesus are going to be raised to eternal life in a new creation. And those who don't, we read in Revelation chapter 20, they are going to be raised to eternal death, a separation from God, in a place called hell. And hell is a reality that begins now. But what we need to understand about that is, is hell is not a surprise. It's not like, oh, you didn't make it, snap. <laughs> it's a continuation of a lifestyle apart from God that begins here and stretches into eternity. And sometimes we have this idea that God sends people to hell. God doesn't send anyone to hell. God's desire is that everyone will be saved. We ask, well, what about those people who haven't heard about Jesus? What about them? So my answer to that is, well, what about you? 
But what about Jesus said about the Great Commission to you who follows him to go make disciples of all nations? Like, I think Jesus already answered that question. So stop shifting the spotlight onto everybody else and, and let's make sure that you are right with God because you've heard the gospel and you have a choice to respond to it or to reject it. So when Jesus comes back, we have this, this resurrection of the those who belong to Christ and those who don't belong to Christ and is a resurrection to eternal death in hell and a resurrection to eternal life in the new creation. And, and all of this leads us to understand that heaven is not somewhere out there. It's not somewhere like distant. It's not pearly gates. It's not in the clouds. It's not an endless sing-along of hymns with robes and harps and those kind of things. Like, I, I, don't know, I think these ideas come from Hollywood. I'm not sure. But really, the biblical idea of heaven is that it's the kingdom of God coming to earth and that there's a renewal of creation. Not that everything disappears and goes somewhere else, but what is here becomes new. And there's a quote which we've shared before by Mr. Elkhorn, and he says, Heaven is not what we think it is, but where our minds really go to is the eternal state, where we'll spend eternity, where we'll live forever after the culminating event of human history that's linked to Christ's return, our resurrection. We'll reign over a resurrected universe centered on a resurrected earth. We will eat and drink and, and work and play and worship and discover and invent and, and travel. Civilization will be resurrected, including human cultures with distinctive ethnic traits. There will be both resurrected nature and human culture, and together these elements combine to distinguish the eternal state where God will come down and live with his people. And we have again this picture of what was in the beginning of Genesis, and this is the picture that we have in in Revelation is God with his people where there's a, a ruling and reigning as God intended things to be. And there's going to be life in a transformed existence. It's a, it's a redeeming of culture. And from this, we, it, it's actually something that we can begin to get excited about and go, like, if God is good and he is good and he knows the desires of our hearts he, he's created something which is going to be thrilling and it's going to be exciting. And it's not, heaven is not going to be boring. Hell is going to be an ultimate bore, a, a place of desolation and tragedy and a complete lack of purpose or any direction. Now, I know that a lot. So I, I hope you guys are at some level still with me. How about you guys in the back? There's a few people down here. It's about five of us. <laughs> Maybe you should send that question in for the next couple of weeks. In fact, maybe we can just answer that now. Right in the beginning, <laughs> God gave man a purpose, which was to tend and look after the garden before the fall. So work was something that was created before the fall and not after. It's not a consequence of sin. It's part of God's original design, is to have purpose. So, this was a lot. Let me, let me recap a couple of things about, uh, let me give you three things about Christianity. One, Christianity is, I would say, the only faith system which addresses how things are in the world today and tells the story of hope. Other religions may have an attempt at this, and I'm not trying to be an apologist for Christianity. God doesn't need to defend himself, but just to help us see how some of the things, sometimes, because sometimes we hear this or we say this, but Christianity is just like every other religion. If you remove grace from Christianity, it is like every other religion, but grace is the defining factor. This gift of God that is unmerited favor, undeserved favor, something that cannot be earned, it can't be added to, it can't be taken away from, it can't be paid back. This is the hinge factor. This separates our belief in Jesus from everything else. And when Christianity begins to tend towards legalism, which is about rules and all the things that you have to do and you have to look like this and do that and say that, then it begins to look like every other religion. But grace is scandalous. And grace should make us be shocked and go like, this cannot be true, amen? 
When we begin to get a handle of it, this is what separates everything. So, so Christianity, on the one hand, it brings this idea, this concept. Jesus himself said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. But take courage, I've overcome the world. It explains how things are, have come to be the way they are and what God is doing about it. And Christianity, it brings truth in the sense that there's an invitation to test it. And it lines up historically, philosophically. And in fact, the Bible says about itself, test these things. And there's no other religion that invites a testing of it, historically, philosophically. And the best argument that there can be from other religions is, well, this is just the way it is. But the most important thing is grace. And Christianity says that today you can be assured that you are right with God. You don't have to wait one day as a surprise to find out, is it in my T's and C's? What happens one day when I get there? You can know with certainty today, with faith, that you are right with God. There's an invitation into a relationship with a God who is personal and loving and who cares about you. The message of Christianity that what Jesus said is that you are saved by grace through faith alone. You don't have to clean up your act before you come to Him. You don't have to work hard at your long jump to jump a little closer to Madagascar. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in Jesus and His finished work on the cross. Lee Strobel said, all we needed when we first came to Jesus was His grace, and grace is all we need to grow in Christ. And grace liberates us, but our tendency towards performance, that imprisons us. And that's what I saw in my life when I celebrated my birthday this week is, is a tendency towards performance because I was like looking at my track record and going, these words don't line up with my track record. I realize my performance is beginning to imprison me. And that's not grace. And I feel like today God wants to set you free from the prison of performance. He wants to break off the shackles of a performance anxiety. He wants to wash away any guilt or condemnation that you have felt and answer with certainty for you the, for you the question, am I right with God? If I were to die today, that there's no surprises, that you can know with certainty eternal life has begun.